We're so happy to have you with us on this afternoon. Uh, we pray that your worship experiences on today have been incredible. We'd like to thank Pastor Thompson for this opportunity to stand before you um, as a class of men, women, single people, married, and maybe even some children. So we are blessed on today, and we'd like to start with a word of prayer as we begin our lesson. Father in heaven, most gracious God, Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, how worthy is your name in all the earth. Father, we thank you for these moments that you allow us to gather, Father. We ask you that you would uh, please illuminate my mind so that I might see things that I've never seen before. Then, Father, we ask that you prick the ears of the listeners, Father, that they may hear something they've never heard before. And Father, we just thank you that today maybe some life might be changed. So, Father, we just bless your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Our lesson today is called Offering Hope for the Future. Offering Hope for the Future. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 29. Uh, we're starting at the 13th verse. But first, let me uh, tell you that sometimes uh, in our lives, we need to offer people hope for the future. Uh, sometimes our right nows are not going as well as, they, uh, as we would want them to go. And, and, and we need to know that we serve a God of not only the right now, not only the here and now, but we serve a God of the future, a God of the afterward. And I can guarantee you that this is a gracious God in whom you can put your life in his hands and that no matter what your life looks like right now, he can carry you through the end through the ups and through the downs, and there is always going to be good news for the future. So Isaiah is the prophet uh, in, in, in chapter 29. He is offering hope to a group of people who are about to be punished. Uh, they're going to go into exile, but he says that even though God's going to get you, that in the end, he's going to renew you. He's going to refresh you. He's going to regather you. He's going to do good things for you in the future. So let us read uh, chapter 29, verses 13 is where we're starting. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as these people draw near to me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but I have removed, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of man. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent man shall be hid. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from God, and their works are in the dark. And they say, who seeth us? Who knoweth us? Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, how made me, he made me not? And shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding? Is it not yet? a very little while, and Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest. And in the day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the holy ones of Israel. For the terrible one is brought to naught, and the scorner is consumed. And, that, and all that watch for iniquity are cut off. That make a man an offender for a word, and lay a snare for him that reproveth in the gate, and turn aside the just for a thing of naught. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob? Jacob shall not now be ashamed, neither shall his face 
now wax pale. But when he seeth his children and the work of thine hands in the midst of him, they shall sanctify my name and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and fear the Lord God of Israel. They also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. God bless the readers, hearers, and most of all, the doers of his holy word. We are just thankful today that we can offer hope for the days of the future. So as we're looking um, at these verses, we notice that God says that his people are only going through the motions. Uh, we know that this motif that we see in Isaiah and in many of the other prophets is of God and his bride, Israel. And the marriage motif is very vivid. And uh, Dr. John Gottman says that there are four characteristics uh, of a relationship in which one can predict divorce. And remember, we're looking at the marriage motif between our God and, 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 and his chosen people, Israel. And Israel has strayed away from him. And four things happen. We begin to feel contempt. We are defensive. We stonewall. And we criticize. These four things are the model for a marriage gone bad. And in our text, God is saying that the marriage is going bad, that, that they no longer love him like they used to love him. They no longer worship him like they used to worship him. They, they, they don't do the things that they used to do. Uh, well, I, I take that back. Really, they still do the things they used to do. They just don't do them with the same heart. You know, what, what happens is sometimes... In, in marriages, we just kind of go through the motions. You know, our, our heart is no longer in it, but we just go through the motions like everything's all right. And, and that's what this people did, but, but they did it to a sovereign God, to an all-knowing, all-seeing God who sees their heart. The Bible says that man sees the outer appearance, but God sees the heart. So here are these men of Israel going through the motions of worship to a holy God who can see their heart. Now, as way of less than context, uh, Isaiah is wanting us to see the sovereignty of, of God. And not only does he want us to see the sovereignty of God, he wants us to see the sovereignty of God over Israel. And even in our day, we need to see the sovereignty of God over the church. We also need to see the sovereignty of God over all of the saints. And Isaiah here is picturing these people, God's people, who have strayed away from him, just as a person in a marriage might stray from their spouse. They have gone on to worship foreign gods, They've gone on to uh, commit what we would call spiritual adultery. Uh, they are no longer loving God with all of their heart, their mind, and their strength. You know, in the day of so Deuteronomy, the Bible said clearly that the, the Israelites said the Shema three times a day, every day. The Shema is love the Lord our God with all our heart, our minds, and our souls. And, and, and they were worshiping him without their heart. Their bodies were going through the motion, but their heart was no longer in it. Now, here comes Isaiah announcing judgment on the Israelites. In that day, they called it a woe. This is just one of the woes that Isaiah wrote uh, toward the nations. This one is pointed toward the Israelites, both in Israel and in Judah. So as we get into the lesson, 
we know that rituals can be good. Ritualism is not good, but, but rituals can be good. But we also know that rituals can be damaging and dangerous. So God has set a pattern for the Israelites. They were to sacrifice. Uh, they were to do things a certain way. Leviticus laid out how the law was supposed to be observed by the Israelites. Laid out perfectly. And, and, and the worship was not supposed to be, um, it was certainly sacrificially based. And, and that's what God asked. But God says that obedience is better than sacrifice. So, so what God wanted them to do was to worship him in spirit and in truth. He wanted them to give him his whole, their whole hearts. And, and this was a group who was going through the motions. They were doing all the same rituals that they used to do, but they no longer cared about the ritual. They did the ritual for ritual's sake. And when you begin to do rituals for ritual's sake, they become dangerous and damaging. As we go into the text in verse 13, it says, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as these people, or this people, draw near me, with me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but they have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of man. So, a couple things. God says, I recognize that you say you love me. I also recognize the things that you do say you don't love me. You know, in this marriage motif, you, you have to recognize that in a marriage, as one person says to another, I love you, but their actions don't show that they love them, it can even be recognized by mere mortals. So, so if, if you can tell me that you love me and show me that you don't, I still have a great idea that you're actually just paying me lip service. And God, who is a sovereign God, the all-knowing God, says to his people, I recognize that you are worshiping me with your mouths. Your lips are saying all of the right things, but I can see beneath your lips. I can see your heart, and I can see that your heart is no longer in it. You know, the, the, many of the attributes of God, the Israelites had taken upon to themselves. Uh, they, they were no longer, they no longer needed God. They, they, they had a structure. They had a worship system. They had a ritualistic system in which they knew how to execute to perfection. But the problem is, their heart wasn't in it. And the person that they were worshiping is an all-knowing and all-seeing God. And he says, I see that you worship me with your lips. But I also see that your heart is far from me. You, you, you know, the, the, there are a lot of the old blues love songs that, 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 that kind of take on this character of Isaiah 29 that, 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 you, that your lip service says that you love me but your actions clearly show me that your heart is somewhere else and that's what God is saying their hearts have left him and gone somewhere else then he also says that they don't have a fear of him anymore and, and it's always essential that saints of God people of God have a healthy reverence for their God. Fear, it, as we understand it, is being afraid of something. God is not necessarily wanting us to be afraid of him, but what he wants us to do is reverence him. Give him the honor and glory that he is due. Reverence him. And they were no longer doing that. He also says, therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, 
even a marvelous work and a wonder for the wisdom of these men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be laid, be hid. Now, when God says he'll do a marvelous work among these people, uh, God had done marvelous works before these people before. And, and when God does marvelous works, it's more for the people who are watching us than for us. Now, just so you know, when, when God does a miracle in your life, it's not it's as much for the people who see it as it is for you. And what God is saying here is we can remember back to, to Joshua when Rahab said to Joshua and the spies, we have heard of you. We are afraid of you because your God is a wondrous and great God. Your God parted the Red Sea. And you walked over on dry ground. And we are all trembling because we are afraid of your God. So when God does a marvelous work such as that, it's for the other folk to see. So now he says, I'm going to do a marvelous work amongst these people. And, and, and he's speaking in irony because what he's going to do is he's going to have them taken into captivity. For all the world to see that they have abandoned their God and now their God is about to show them what that really looks like. You know, one of the incredible things about us reverencing God and loving him with our hearts and our minds and our strength is that he recognizes clearly who's faking and who's not. He knows your heart. We see the outside. You can fool us, but you cannot fool God. So God's going to do a marvelous work so that the people, mainly Israel's enemies, can see that God is punishing them. He says what he's going to do is he's going to take their wisdom that the wise men believe they have, and it's going to just disappear. It's going to perish. Then he says the understanding of the prudent man, the wise man, well, that's going to be hid. Then he says what Isaiah only can say in verse 15, Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from God, and their works are in the dark. And they say, Who seeth us and who knoweth us? That, that does sound like us, doesn't it? He says, How in the world could you believe that you could hide from the counsel of God. How could you even put that in your mind? Then he says, secondly, those things that you do in the dark, I'm going to expose those. I'm going to bring those to the light. All those things you do, in the, you do these things at night where people don't see, but the one who really sees, really sees. Then he says, that in our minds, we say to ourselves, who sees us? Who knows us? The God of heaven who made us sees us and knows us. We don't not sin because we want to look good in public. We don't sin because we want to look blameless before God. But these men... This Israel had lost respect for God, and now they ran roughshod over God, and they didn't care anymore. They said, who sees us? Who knows what we do? So they're limiting God's sovereignty, that, that believing that they can hide their plans from God. Who's silly enough to believe they can hide their plans from God? Surely. Your turnings of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. Now look at this. For shall the work, the piece of clay. How does the piece of clay say to the potter, you didn't make me? How then does the piece of artwork say to the framer, you have no understanding? 
So, so God is about to turn their lives upside down with punishment because what they've done is they put themselves ahead of God. And the clay, the creation, has now established itself as the creator. They no longer respect God. They're no longer giving God their full attentive worship. They're going through the motions. They're doing the things that they want to do. And they have enough nerve to say to the potter, you didn't make me. To say to the framer, you don't understand. Verse 17 says, it is not yet a very little while. And Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field. And the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest. Now we need to look at this as clearly as we can look at this. We're looking at metaphor. And what God is saying is in the millennial period, when I reign a thousand years and the devil is bound, that's what he talks about when he says, yet a little while. That's the period of time he's talking about. That's the hope for the future. You know, what happens is right now, the Bible clearly says that Satan is the prince of the air. And that this is his world. And this is his system that we live under. And God is saying that won't always be. But for a little while. The beauty of God is that no one knows that they are, are the hour that he'll break open the heavens. And, and surely this group who has digressed so far from the covenant, he loves us so much, even in our filth, that he's going to redeem us, even if it's far into the future. One day, Lebanon will be turned into a fruitful field. The assumption is if it has to be turned into a fruitful field one day, it's an unfruitful field now. Lebanon is known for its great trees and forest. Matter of fact, we know that Nehemiah got wood from the king's forest, which was in Lebanon, to rebuild the walls. But one day, he says, this fruitful field will be esteemed as a forest. That the low position that these Israelites have gone to, the depths they have fallen to, one day they will be restored. And he's talking about the millennial period of time, the thousand years where he'll reign. He says, and in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book. In that day shall the eyes of the blind see out of obscurity and out of darkness. We're looking at verse 18, and verse 18 is saying to us that there is going to be a day when God's going to turn this world upside down. That those that are on the top may be on the bottom. Those that are on the bottom may be on the top. Those who are blind will see. Those who see it will be blind. Those who are deaf will hear the words in the book. You know, in God's upside down economy, I love the fact that he says the first shall be last and the last shall be first. What he means is that one day you have esteemed yourself so high on the earth and you believe yourself to be the king right here on earth. But one day he's going to lay you low. And somebody, the pauper, the one who has no money, no fields, no vision, no, no, no sight, no hearing. He's going to be the one who will be highly esteemed in God's upside down economy. You know, we, we used to say uh, in the secular world, be careful who you handle on your way up. Because those are the same people you might have to check out again on your way down. Be careful in God's upside down economy. The ones who look like they're at the bottom. One day they will be at the top. He says the meek also 
So the poor, the blind, the deaf, now the meek shall increase their joy in the Lord. And the poor among them shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. It's a beautiful thing. You know, gives us hope for the future. That whatever situation you're going through down here, it's really big to you. And it's really big to you. And it should be big to you. Because there are people who are sick. There are people who are infirm. There are people who are destitute. There are people who are homeless. There are people who are bereaved. And in their lives right now, they feel downtrodden. But this is the word that they need to hear. That one day, the deaf will hear. The blind will see. The poor will have joy. You know, we... Uh, I love this word joy. Ray Mahal taught me about this word years ago. He said the joy is spelled J-O-Y. I already knew that. But he said the acronym stands for Jesus first, others second, and us last. See, see, when you have true joy, you're humble and, and, and you're meek. You don't have, you're not weak, but you're meek. It means that, it means that you have the proper attitude about who you are. You have not elevated yourself to the status that these Israelites had elevated themselves to. They had elevated themselves to a higher status than even their God. But God says one day, there's, there's going to come a day when meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. You don't have to know what's happening here. Uh, the rich in this period of time, constantly took advantage of the poor. They treated them unfairly in their courts. They stole from them. They took their land. Uh, and, and, and they did all manner of things for them. And you know that the Old Testament, in its core, says take care of the widows and the orphans. They no longer did the things that God had asked them to do. They were just going through the motions. And God is calling them out. Then he says in verse 20, uh, 20 is going to be judgment time for the unjust. Judgment time for the unjust. He says, for the terrible one is brought to naught. I don't know if you know what that word naught means. It means to nothing. Uh, naught is the old school word that means nothing. And the scorner is consumed. Consumed means to be combusted from the inside out. When you blow up a building, you, you don't explode it, you implode it. Exploding it means that you explode it from the outside in. Imploding means you terminate it from the inside out. And God says what he's going to do is that the scorner is going to be consumed. Uh, you know, fire consumes. And, and there are going to be many people who are going to get a chance to see the fire one day. And it's going to be all-consuming. He says, and that watch for iniquity are cut off. So he talks about the terrible one bring, being brought to naught, the scorner being consumed, and the one who watches the iniquity. If you watch iniquity, you are just as guilty as the one who is practicing iniquity. You know, we have to be careful how we understand life. Saying nothing at all makes you complicit. Complicit means you're just as guilty as the one who's doing the sin. Some of us are quiet. We don't speak up for the, for the meek. We don't speak up for the homeless. We, we don't help the poor. We just get and get and get and get and, and we're not concerned about those people who God is concerned about, the widows and the orphans. He says that make a man an offender for the word and lay a snare for him that reproveth the gate. You know, the elders used to be at the gate and, and, and they used to uh, impart wisdom onto the people. He says, now you lay a snare for him. He says, you make a man an offender for the word. You know, those who were trying to be prudent, 
those who were trying to execute holiness. They, instead of being looked upon as the leaders, instead of being looked upon as the ones uh, who should get recognition, they were the ones who were being mocked. Uh, the ones who were trying to live right were the ones who were being mocked. Uh, it says, and turn aside the just for a thing of naught. You know, it's amazing to me sometimes what we will give for something that's so important, unimportant. We'll do all manner of sin for a thing that has no relative importance in all of the world. God calls it a thing of naught, a thing that has no value. We will rid ourselves of something that has complete value and take something instead that has absolutely no value. And God is calling this people out. These are his chosen people, but he's calling them out because right now they deserve to be called out because they're not living the life that God has called them to live. They are strictly going through the motions. Many of us know there are Christians among us in these seats, in these pews, that are just going through the motions. They're here not to worship. They're here to be seen. They're not here to be cleansed. They're here to enjoy word. And God says for those people who would trade in something so valuable for something that has no value, it's a shame. It's an absolute shame and a travesty the way that God's people treated God in this section of Isaiah. And don't get me wrong, my brothers and sisters, it's a shame how some of us treat God. We're, we're guilty as well. Many of us treat God any kind of way. We go through the motions. We give our offering. We don't give our offering with a cheerful heart. We give our offering out of obligation. We give it because we think we should. We give it because we think people are watching. And God says he loves a person who gives with a cheerful and generous heart. As we're moving toward the end, verse 22 says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall now not be ashamed, neither shall his face bow, now wax pale. When, when God refers to Israel as Jacob, he is not complimenting them. If you know anything about the character of Jacob, God is calling them the tricky one, the heel grabber. So, so when God talks about Israel, he calls them Jacob. He is certainly not saying good things about them. He said he redeemed Abraham. He said, but it concerned the house of Jacob in that day. Jacob would no longer have to be ashamed. You know, Jacob did a lot of things in his life. And God still blessed him and even renamed him after he redeemed him. But clearly we want to know that God is calling his people, his chosen people, Jacob. And he is not complimenting them. He said, but when Jacob sees his children the work of his own hands, in the midst of him, they shall sanctify my name and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and shall fear the God of Israel. When we get to the millennial kingdom, God will make it all right. All the wrong that we know about now, all the unjust and inequitable things that happen here on our earth, here in our country will be no longer because God says he's going to make everything right. That's why we have hope for the future. That's why we can have hope for the future because God has great things planned for us in the future. The rapture is coming in the future. 
one day the heavens are going to open up. The trump of God is going to sound. And like the voice of an archangel, Jesus himself is going to call his people to himself. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then those of us who remain shall follow and meet him in the air. Great things are going to happen for the saints of God and for the children of Israel. And there is hope for the future. So it doesn't matter where you are in life at this very moment. There's hope for the future. Uh, God has a bright future for you, even if you don't understand it to be a bright future. One of the problems we have in, our, in all of our lives is that we step over God's blessings because they aren't in the way we asked for them. God has given us these things, and instead of being joyful in our hearts, we're hateful in our hearts because God didn't give it to us our way. Well, you need to know that there's going to be a day of subjection. It's called the judgment. And, and that's what God is doing to his people in Isaiah 29. Soon and very soon, Sennacherib the king of Assyria is going to come down and he's going to slaughter the folk in the northern kingdom. He's gonna, you know, we like the story of Babylon because Babylon came and took the captives back, took the nobles and, and the rich people back with them and, 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 and acclimated them to their society. That's not how the Assyrians worked. The Assyrians came in and they killed, pillaged, and raped. One of the things that the Assyrians are known for is when they would defeat an enemy, they would go in and they would cut the heads off the nobles. And they would put a stick in the ground and then shove their heads on the stick. And then they would look around at all the people and say, you got it? You understand? You understand how this is working? That's what the Assyrians did. They asserted their dominance. And that's the group that God is going to bring to punish the Israelites, the northern kingdom. Uh, and that's what Isaiah is predicting. He says, woe unto you, you with unclean lips, you who serve God with your lips only. You lip service folk. You folk who don't really mean what you say. You folk who don't actually love God with all of your heart, your mind, and your soul, and all your strength. You, woe to you. And as he finishes, in verse 24, he says, They also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding, and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. This is good news for everybody. This is good news for everybody. Because God is going to demonstrate his steadfast love for his people, good and bad. All of those who erred against the way of God, the covenant of God, he says, I'm going to even redeem them. I'm going to bring them back into the fold. You know, what deliverance ought to do for you is it ought to help you praise. When you come out of something, that ought to help you praise. When, when, when you've been down low and God brings you back up to the surface and you can breathe fresh air again, that should bring you to a place of praise. You should love God with all of your heart, your mind and your soul and all of your strength. Whatever you do on this day, examine yourself. Decide if your worship is authentic. Is your worship transparent? Is it real? Or are you just going through the motions? God bless you and God keep you is my prayer.